<laughs> Good morning. Welcome to the live in-person and live Zoom worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Riverside. Our opening hymn this morning is number 170, We Are a Gentle Angry People from the Grey Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but please only with your masks on. Please stand and body your spirit and join us in singing hymn number 170, We Are a Gentle Angry People. Thank you for joining us here in person, and thank you for joining us remotely by Zoom. We'll, we will continue live streaming and posting these services on our YouTube channel for our virtual attendees. I'm Grace Price, a member of the Worship Committee, and I will be your Worship Associate today. Other members of the Worship Committee you will hear from include Alec Peck, who is Chair of the Worship Committee, as well as our Music Coordinator, who will be delivering the sermon this morning. We welcome you to join us this morning with an open mind and an open heart, and with muted electronic devices, please. We invite you to leave your worries and defenses at the door and trust that what happens in worship is inspiring and powerful. Together, we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate, and wiser as we begin a new day and a new week. Although our doors are open, the pandemic is not over. So while we are in the sanctuary, please keep your masks on and socially distance. And now I invite you to sit back 
and take a slow, deep breath as we move on into our worship hour. Before we move into the service, however, there are a few announcements that we would like to share. During the service, we will mention several websites, email addresses, and phone numbers. At the end of this service, we will leave up a slide with all of this information, and it is also available on our website. Uh, our monthly COVID announcement. To safely go about our daily lives, let's keep taking the following steps to stop the spread. Vaccinations have so far proven to be safe and effective. Children six months and older are now eligible to get vaccinated. Please wear a mask where required and to, so that we could protect the vulnerable and get tested if you're sick. You can make an appointment at vaccine.ca.gov or for more information and more options of vaccine locations, please go to covid19.ca.gov. Let's all take personal responsibility to protect ourselves and others because we are all in this together. Uh, the first announcement is a change in the Sunday service time. Please note that Sunday services will go back to starting at 10 a.m. beginning sun next Sunday, September 4th. Um, please dis disregard the information on the half sheet that you may have gotten at the door. Um, there was a misprint, and I, we'd just like to confirm that the services will start at 10 a.m. next week. That being said, first Sunday luncheons are back. Don't forget to join us next week after the service for the first Sunday luncheon. Next week, the theme will be salads. Hope to see you there. The Labor Day barbecue has been postponed. We are postponing the barbecue due to the excessive heat expected next weekend. We are thinking of some time in November and we'll keep you informed. Now Adam has an announcement from the Social Environmental Justice Committee regarding the upcoming elections. Adam? Good morning. I've got a really quick announcement. Um, last week, the Social and Environmental Justice Committee looked over all the propositions. There's gonna be seven propositions on the ballot in November. Um, we looked up, you know, looked up all the information about them, discussed them, and voted on recommendations for all of them based on our values. Um, if you didn't get a sheet as you came in, there is a sheet, should be a sheet as you leave by the door um, that's got all the propositions, um, how we voted, uh, you know, what we recommended to vote, and a little description of the discussion we had that explains why we, why we viewed it that way. If you'd like, you can also, especially for those online, you can go to uuchurchofriverside.org slash justice, and that's a social and environmental justice page. Right up at the top there is the same thing, all the propositions, but there you can also click on the proposition. There's a link to the Ballotpedia page, which has a whole lot of information where the funding is coming from, who's supporting it, all the arguments in favor against all that kind of stuff. So check that out if you've got time, because remember our fifth principle um, is the use of the democratic process, and that is really important to our faith. Uh, make sure you vote in November. Thank you. Thank you for that, Adam. That concludes our announcements. So now we will um, take a slow, deep breath as we move into the worship hour. For our call to worship, you are welcome to read with me the mission statement of our church. Our mission is to foster a diverse religious community that celebrates life, affirms the individual, encourages spiritual growth and open thought, and works to advance social justice and environmental sustainability. Today's sermon will be given by UUCR member Alec Peck. Alec has been a practicing UU for 23 years, raised in a UU church, chosen by his father, who was raised Quaker, and his mother, who was raised Jewish, though both are humanist in practice. Alec has studied natural science at Crichton University, a Jesuit institution, and is now completing his PhD at UC Riverside while serving as chair of the worship committee here at UUCR. 
the UUA and UU congregations around the world are considering adding a new eighth principle to the doctrine of our faith. The first seven principles are uh, listed up there on this wall. And this would uh, add to the, the seven principles that are already existing. The new principle came about from our living tradition to examine and renew the tenets of our religion. It reads, the eighth principle affirms and promotes journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. The eighth principle has been adopted by hundreds of UU communities already. And today we will explore its purpose, its origins, and why so many congregations have already elected to support it. We have two lightings of sacred flames. The first is the occupied indigenous people's remembrance candle. The second is the lighting of our own chalice, the symbol of our faith. We walk upon the traditional territories of diverse and sovereign peoples, the original people of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. This spot we occupy was first the sacred space of several groups of indigenous peoples, including the Kawia, the Cupeño, and the Serrano. We, the Universalist Unitarian Church of Riverside, light this sacred flame as the stewards of this sacred and holy place. We are blessed with a space and opportunity to strive to live out our common principles, to bring justice, equity, and compassion into our daily lives, to resist all that threatens the earth and her people, and to be part of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Let these thoughts carry us forth as we journey and worship together. Our chalice lighting today is by Anastasi Biroche. As we light this flame of hope, may our congregation become a kaleidoscope of souls and people. In the presence of this flame, in me, in you, in us, is an invitation to sit at the table. May we tend our soul fire through these challenging and trying times to open the hearts and minds of all who enter our doors. Thank you, Alec. Greeting our guests. We have a tradition at UUCR to welcome those who are visitors or perhaps returning after some time away. We know it can be uncomfortable to stand up and speak in front of others. So I will now ask for a volunteer from someone who has been here a while to tell us your name and how you found out about our church. We ask you to step close to the mic and speak into it directly and clearly so everyone can hear. Oh, Dinah, just in time, welcome. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Dinah Rowe. My husband and I have been members, my husband Bill and I have been members since 2004. Prior to that, we were in the Long Beach Church. When we moved this area, we found this church and started here. Thank you. Thank you, Dinah. Thank you, and that's how it's done. So if you are new here, a visitor or an old friend, please raise your hand to stand and come up to the mic in front of the pulpit. Do we have anyone in the audience who'd like to come up and introduce themselves this morning? Please come up. Hello, my name is Renee. Um, okay. Um, okay, what were you supposed to say? Um, just your name um, and how you found out about the church. Um, I was going to the courthouse and I drove by and we seen the welcome you know, like love is love, and uh, we decided to come here. Mm -hmm. We're happy you're here. Thank you. Is there anyone else? 
the audience. Hi, Good my morning. name is Jordan. Hello, Jordan. Um, yeah, I've been working around here lately. Mm -hmm. um, this building, this building, um, you know, looked pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was so small on the inside. Mm -hmm. How how old is this building? Um, I believe it was built in 18, 1892. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And is there anyone else here today? Okay. If there's someone online who'd like to introduce themselves, please raise your hand and we will call you on Zoom. Please let us know who you are, where you're from, and how you found out about us. For any other new guests, please join us for socializing and coffee hour after the service. We'd love to chat with you out in the parish hall where you can also find our visitor's book. Please leave your name before you leave so that we know you are here and leave your contact information if you'd like to know about upcoming events. For those online, the best way to get added to the mailing list is to email the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org. Our hymn now is number 121, We'll Build a Land from the Gray Hymnal. Feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but please wear your masks. Please stand in body and spirit and join us in singing number 121, We'll Build a Lamb.
Sharing our treasure. This portion of our service is to support our beloved historical church. This can be accomplished in several ways. In addition to the weekly collection, you may send your checks to the church address, which is shown here. You may also contribute by PayPal using the QR code, which is on the church website and also in the newsletter. Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater grocery cards, which we will have in church each Sunday. You'll get the full value and the church also receives a percentage. Please donate as the spirit moves you by whatever method works best for you. Thank you for your generosity. And to those who give of their time and their talent, thank you for your generous care and attention. Will our ushers now please come forward to receive the collection? Our next hymn, number 402, from You I Receive, is from the Gray Hymnal. Please feel free to sing as the spirit moves you, but again, with your masks on. Please stand and body your spirit and join us in singing hymn number 402, from You I Receive. meditation today is by Nathan Ryan. It's entitled, Our Faith's Complacency in Racism. We have an absurd amount to learn or unlearn about race in this country. America allowed slavery to exist by seeking out personal and regional salvation at the expense of universal salvation. Our country felt better about itself because with the South as the identified patient, it never had to look at its own addiction. In the pre-emancipation South, most whites and almost all blacks were poor. Only a handful of plantation owners held the wealth. The North and many Unitarian-led cities 
spread their share of the stolen enslavement money from cotton, sugar, etc., into factories and production that, while partially benefiting the rich, supported middle and working class white people. Much of our faith's amassed wealth came about this way. Worse, our Unitarian forebears justified keeping this money by perpetuating the mythology that we were the good anti-racist part of the country. And so in addition to having an absurd amount to learn or unlearn about race in this country, we have also an absurd amount to learn and unlearn about our faith's complacency in its racism. We as a faith have benefited and continue to benefit directly from a system that garners wealth and safety at the expense of black people. So far, our faith has not done the work to unlearn the mythologies that perpetuate cultural supremacy in this country. Although many of the terms might make some of us uncomfortable, we must notice how mythologies that go wholly unexamined in our faith are, in actuality, perpetuating systems of oppression. We must dedicate ourselves to building a new system of radical universalist inclusion that loves all people. Now let us pause for a moment of silence to reflect on this meditation. Now, I would like to introduce Alec Peck, who will be speaking to us on an introduction to the Eighth Principle. Alec. Thank you, Grace. I have an extra slide with the Eighth Principle shown uh, on it. I think it should just be the next slide. We may as well switch to that now. Thank you, Adam. As Grace mentioned today, I'd like to talk to you about the eighth principle. I really wanted to talk to you about this after I had a really great discussion about it at a UU summer camp that I go to and I've been going to for several decades, uh, which is considerable considering um, I'm only a few decades old. And I really just want to talk to you, since we, it's fairly new, it's really only come about in the last year, year and a half. And so I really want to just talk about what it's all about and where it came from, because I was quite interested to learn uh, the history and why we really need it. After all, it has been adopted in over 200 UU communities already. And so I just want to sort of talk about what all the fuss is all about. And I wanted to start with the commission which was made by the Unitarian Universalist Association regarding uh, the commission of the eighth principle. As we talked about, or as Grace mentioned also in our introduction, our principles are the core of, in my opinion at least, what makes us all you use. We all believe in some way that believing in that practice in the eighth principles or what it means to be a good person, that what it means to be a good person is to respect our inherent worth of every person, to respect the interdependent web of life from which we are all apart, and to do that using a free and open search for truth and meaning. And so it's important that we understand uh, why we need each principle separately, because I've heard some people say that all the other principles, if you truly believe in the first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, you really shouldn't need the other ones. And I just don't think that's true. I think we really do need all of them in order to have a good, really well-grounded sense of our morality and where that comes from. And so as part of our living tradition, 
it's important to have a process of reflection and self-examination, which is how this came about. The seven principles, and this is from the UUA's website, I am reading this. The seven principles of Unitarian Universalism are part of Article 2, Principles and Purposes of the Unitarian Universalist Association Bylaws, member congregations promise each other in covenant to affirm and promote these principles. The Article 2 Study Commission is a function of the UUA bylaws for the periodic review of the covenant between the member congregations in consultation with the General Assembly. The Board of Trustees is charged, charged the Article 2 Study Commission to include the essence of the eighth principle. The eighth principle is a grassroots movement which started in 2013, aimed at circulating a commitment to dismantle racism and other forms of oppression within the covenants made between and within the member congregations of the UUA. Adopting the eighth principle at the local level is an act of covenant made amongst the members of that congregation to be anti-racist. The covenant between congregations can be shaped by engaging in the A2SC process and voting on the amended Article 2 at the 2013 and 2014 General Assemblies. You can learn more at uua.org slash A2SC. <clears throat> Unitarian Universalism is no stranger to movements that call for racial justice, both within and beyond our institution. Over and over again, pockets of our people have worked to say that racism is a problem, racism is a problem for us, and that we are committed to fighting racism and other oppressions. And in 1997, the General Assembly voted to commit to intentionally become an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural institution, and yet almost 25 years later, we continue to fall short of our commitment and our promises. When the Eighth Principle Project began, it addressed something vital that had been missing in our UU movement, namely that anti-racism and anti-oppression must be central to congressional, congregational life and our community building. The Mammoth project of fostering conversation within congregations and other communities, and then calling on those communities to make an explicit statement in the form of the eighth principle has become a true ground, groundswell within Unitarian Universalism. The context of the eighth principle, the text of the eighth principle, uh, we've already shared and you can see on the screen. Uh, in the process of examining and possibly revising Article 2, those of that being our principles of the UUA bylaws, is a scheduled effort of the UUA board demanded by the bylaws themselves. The study commission, who has been charged with making a proposal to the UUA board in January of 2013, has tremendous respect for what the Eighth Principle Movement has accomplished and is accomplishing within UU communities. More than the language of the Eighth Principle itself, we are moved by the ongoing conversation about what it means to be anti-racist anti and anti-oppression as an inextricable part of our Unitarian Universalist faith. And so, though the task we have been charged with is larger than the specifics of the principle itself, we understand these ideals to be at the very heart of our work and very much a part of the direction that we are journeying. We understand that the work we are doing to build on the strengths of the Eighth Principle Movement, we, whatever flows, grows from the process of engaged UUs in this reimagining, the seeds sown by the Eighth Principle Project will surely bloom brightly. And so it is also our responsibility to engage today with it. And so I want to focus a little bit about what is this statement about? A lot of the first things that most people point out, my mom, who's a writer included, is that this is very wordy, especially compared to some of the other principles. And I think you can sort of just, at least to get the idea, ignore that first uh, stanza. Uh, the journeying towards spiritual wholeness. I think the important part is that we are covenanting to build a diverse, beloved community using our actions to dismantle 
those systemic problems within ourselves and our institutions. There's a key word in here, beloved community, that gets capital letters. This is something that Dr. King defined as a global vision in which all people can share in the wealth of the earth, a world where racism and other forms of discrimination, bigotry and prejudice were, will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. When we are practicing the beloved community, we center love for humanity, love as accountability, love as justice, love as community, love as belonging. Because our community should be one of radical acceptance. None of the other principles explicitly mention love, and by having beloved community in the eighth principle, it brings our commitment to love higher in our consciousness and consistent with our standing on the Side of Love campaign. Dr. King outlined three important factors for what we must overcome to accomplish a beloved community. Poverty, that is unemployment, homelessness, hunger, malnutrition, illiteracy, infant mortality in slums. He said, there is nothing new about poverty. What is new, however, is that we now have the resources to get rid of it. The time has come for an all out war against poverty. The well off and the secure have too far often, have too often become indifferent and oblivious to the poverty and deprivation in their midst. Ultimately, the goal and of a great nation is a compassionate nation. No individual or nation can be great if it does not have a concern for the least of these. Thank you, Grace. Racism, prejudice, apartheid, ethnic conflict, anti-Semitism, sexism, colonialism, homophobia, ageism, discrimination against disabled groups, stereotypes, and other hierarchies that seek to form in-groups and out-groups. Another quote from Dr. King Jr. Racism is a philosophy based on a contempt for life. It is the arrogant assertion that one race is the center of value and object of devotion before which other races must kneel in submission. It is the absurd dogma that one race is responsible for all the progress of history and alone can assure the progress of the future. Racism is a total estrangement. It separates not only bodies, but minds and spirits. Inevitably, it de descends into inflicting spiritual and physical homicide upon the outgroup. Militarism, war, empiricism, domestic violence, rape, terrorism, human trafficking, media violence, drugs, child abuse, violent crime. Dr. King said about this, a true revolution of values will lay hands on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This way of burning human beings with napalm or filling our nation's homes with orphans and windows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped, physically, psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continue year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. One of the other main criticisms of this, mine included, is why are we singling out racism? as a particular form of racial of hierarchy, one of, one of only many axes of oppression which we experience now in our modern day, especially it's been one that has been of great focus only in especially the last years 
uh, decades since the civil rights movement. At a global level, this would not make any sense. For instance, the oppression of women is a fundamental to poverty and a lack of development in many areas. But in the USA, racism stands out. The two worst crises in the UUA, in the late 90s until now, were both related to race. Racism in the US stems from Chattel slavery, where people were un uniquely illegally treated as property that could be inherited for something, aka skin color, that they had no control over. The UUA has done well with women becoming ministers and leaders. The seven principles themselves came out of the women's movement within UUism. But there is still a gap in our own experience with race. The LGBTQIA plus community is well represented as members, ministers, RE staff, and other leadership in individual congregations and in the UUA, and the Welcoming Congregation program has been well effective. We could use something similar for racism. Some congregations have done a good job of making sure they are accessible to people with disabilities, although many UU spaces are still not fully accessible. And although we have made great strides with regards to L, G, B, and B, we certainly still have a lot of work to do in the T and the Q sector. The UA, the UUA, the US, and the world also have a lot of problems deeply based in economic class oppression, as Martin Luther King Jr. realized, in addition to militarism and materialism. This pr principle includes that, but is not highlighting it. This principle also draws us to be self-critical of our community. Whiteness and chattel slavery, that is structural racism, were invented in the US at the same time that modern Unitarianism and Universalism were being created. Unitarians originally were largely from New England European American elite, often did not treat Native American peoples well, benefited directly from slavery, or indirectly, and some were leaders in the eugenics movement, promoting birth control for people of color because they were seen as inferior. Our first principle caused us to study our own structures and the inherent worth that we see within ourselves as we see in others. And our seventh principle tells us to look at how our connections with other people. But this says nothing about the fact that the complex web which emerges out of all of our connections itself has emergent problems. Our principles already demand us to be critical in ourselves and those connections, but our connections are more than the sum of our parts. And so we have to address those extra emergent pieces separately from what the seventh principle says. And since our religion was formed at the same time as these same structural societal <clears throat> patterns in the US, our human connections, uh, we must be studied and understood in that context because we are in some kind of equilibrium with the racism heat bath that we're embedded in. And our human connections between each other are a destiny that we get to choose. And so we have to reflect on them intentionally. Paula Cole Jones of JPD, the Joseph Priestley District, the Mid-Atlantic District of the UUA, now summed into the larger Central Eastern Region Group, the CERG, Director of Racial and Social Justice, developed the idea of the existence of two different paradigms in UU circles, the UU Seven Principles and Beloved Community, that is, deep multiculturalism. After working with congregations on these issues for over 15 years, she realized that a person can believe that they are being a good UU following the seven principles. Most UU congregations are primarily European American in membership. After all, let's look around. 
as, and culture, especially in music, and in leadership, especially when located near uh, diverse communities. She realized that an eighth principle was needed to correct this and talked with Bruce Pollock Johnson about some of the components that should be in it. Bruce put together an initial draft in 2013 and the two of them worked with a group of anti-racist activists in the JPD to refine it. Bruce's congregation, the UU Church of Restoration in Philadelphia, incorporated it into their covenant at that time, then in May 2017, and formally adopted for themselves and recommended to the UUA to adopt it. UUs and the UUA have done good work in fighting racism, such as during the civil rights movement and in the 1900s, passing a resolution in 1997 at General Assembly after a precursor resolution in 1992 to become an anti-racist, anti-oppression, multicultural, or ARA, OMC, organization. But the funding and support started to wane in the 2000s on our accountability mechanisms had failed us. For UUs ha also have a mixed record historically in other areas of racial justice. We had people on both sides of abolitionism, including people like Jefferson, who was a slaveholder, and Unitarians were prominent of e proponents of eugenics, leading to some of the racial extremes of Nazism and apartheid in Southern Africa. And now those who fought in the 1960s and 70s for those revolutions are resisting that work that needs to be done today. After all, haven't they fought enough? And I do have to apologize because I do not have that perspective of seeing the decades of work that we have already overcome. But from within almost all UU communities, people of color say that they are made to feel uncomfortable. And the fifth principal project's response to this has been that they should go make their own church. The fifth principal project is named after, of course, the fifth principal, which is they've named themselves after not because they feel it covers what the eighth principle claims, but only because they see it as an excuse not to adopt this as a new principle, the fifth principle being the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations. This is their excuse to schism our church and form and say that those who want to be anti-racist can just form their own church. The EU principles were designed to be dynamic. It is not a fixed creed. It means that we want to always continue to be educating ourselves, exploring truth and raising our consciousness. When we get to a new level of understanding and clarity, our structure makes it possible to reflect that. UU is the only religion that intentionally builds in that flexibility to acknowledge the importance of ongoing revealed truth. This happened when environmental awareness reached a critical mass and was added as the seventh principle, although it also has a multicultural relationship implication. We are approaching a similar critical mass, mass in terms of level of awareness for the systematic nature of racism and other oppressions. Ultimately, the principles and especially this eighth principle are about accountability. We have taken a very Christian, one of many Christian traditions, and one of them is that we have in some levels assumed that UUism is the way that it should be done and we demand that other social movements from the left should fall in line with our existing UU values rather than that we should join their social movements. Our existing seven principles imply this eighth principle, but they do not explicitly hold us accountable for addressing these oppressions directly, especially at a systematic level. If we can truly accept that we have reached acceptance and allyship in terms of our internal racism, can we confess our previous racism? Can we each look back on our past actions and identify when we had been racist that we have now overcome? And do we have the strength to confess it? 
UUism has great potential for building a diverse, multicultural, beloved community as envisioned by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not just European Americans and African Americans, but also Native Americans, Latin American people, and other cultural groups. Globally, we could experience tremendous diversification, vitality, and thriving if it works to embody this vision, but it won't happen without conscious awareness and effort on our part. Dismantling racism, white supremacy, and other oppressions requires work at the personal and institutional levels. And this eighth principle, although wordy, does contain a direct call to action, something which I wish our other principles made a higher emphasis on. The UUA has just gone through a crisis relating to an intense <clears throat> and inclusive hiring practices, especially related to whites being hired over highly qualified Latin American candidates, resulting ultimately in the resignation of the UUA president. In response to this crisis, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, BLUU, and diverse revolutionary UU ministers, that's D-R-U-U-M-M -M or DRUM, I presume, endorses the eighth principle. Blue's main point is that the UUA voted in 1997 at GA to commit to intentionally becoming an ARA OMC institution and intentionally good promises were made with programs including the Journey Towards Wholeness, the Jubilee Anti-Racism Training Workshops, and process evac evaluations at meetings, and cultural, multicultural con consulting services. But in the early 2000s, funding and support for much of this work began to decline. The recent hiring crisis is not a surprise in light of this decreasing support and lost focus. Blue is holding all of the UUA accountable to that commitment and expressing disappointment that the eighth principle has not already been supported and midwifed by UUA leadership. Allies for Racial Equality, ARE, the UU White Ally Group, support Blue in Blue's endorsement of the eighth principle. White supremacy teaching in April 30th and May 7th, including the blue endorsement uh, of this year, that is, of the eighth principle with their resources for planning for their teaching. Um, you can find those resources uh, on their website. Uh, unfortunately, that's that what day just passed. Should have uh, removed that, sorry. <clears throat> but, excuse me. UU funding and focus in the last decade has shifted towards shallow diversity rather than a deep multicultural beloved community and structural change. UU support of the movement for black lives has been encouraged. The best way for us to truly support racial justice in a significant way is to purge ourselves and our institutions of the culture and exclusive practices of whiteness and white supremacy. The new Jim Crow, the mass incarceration and criminal justice system, which have replaced the older systems of slavery and Jim Crow laws, police violence against people of color, recent Supreme Court decisions on voting rights and affirmative action, and the election of Donald Trump with advisors and followers, including Attorney General Jeff Sessions, openly supporting white supremacists show that the country is moving quickly and dangerously in the wrong direction. And you use must take a strong leadership to reverse those trends. I hope that we can continue this discussion and continue thinking about systemic racism within ourselves and within the institutions that we belong to more cognizantly. And I hope that one day soon, our congregation will have an opportunity to vote on whether we would like to adopt the eighth principle for ourselves. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alec.
Our closing hymn is Heart Wide Open, Music and Words by Leah. Feel free to sing as the spirit moves you. Sorry, so the words will be on the screen on the next slide. It's a very easy chant. Uh, it'll, we'll go through the words three times and you can feel free to sing along as the spirit moves you. Um, and, uh, but otherwise you can uh, just listen. Thank you. And we, I don't know how good I will be at answering these questions, uh, but we can, I would definitely like to have our discussion where we can share our thoughts openly. Thank you. Keep your heart wide open Though the waves want to push you around mm, You gotta keep your heart wide open Till your faith brings you back to solid ground mm, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep my heart I'm gonna keep wide open I'm gonna keep my heart wide, wide open Though these waves wanna push Though they want me around Though the waves wanna push me around I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep my heart I'm gonna keep wide open I'm gonna keep my heart wide open Till my faith brings me back Brings me back to solid ground Until my faith brings me back to solid ground We gotta keep We gotta keep our hearts We gotta keep wide open We gotta keep our hearts wide open Keep all these ways Wanna put us around Though these waves wanna push us around We gotta keep our hearts We gotta keep our hearts Wide open Till our faith brings us back Brings us back to solid ground Till our faith brings us back to solid ground Say hi The world aches for us to join together and bring about healing, toil for justice, and produce ever increasing love. This is our calling. Go forth and act accordingly. Amen. Namaste, amen, and blessed be. Thank you, Alec, for sharing your valuable time and insights with us this morning. It is sincerely appreciated, and we look forward to hearing from you again. We will have 10 to 15 minutes for observations and discussion with Alec following the service to share our thoughts on today's topic. Please be aware this will be included on the video that is posted. For those of you who wish to adjourn to the parish hall, please do so. Thank you. I already know you want to say something, Bill, so go ahead. And I'm going to say this right now. Cracker alert. That means I'm about to say something that might, though I don't want it to, sound hurtful. I really hope I don't, but accidents happen, and I'm doing my best. First of all, the problem we have with the seven going into eight is this. Ever carry a large stack of plates? Too large a stack of plates? The holy crap, I forgot this is made out of the stuff of the earth and I am uh, uh, bench pressing uh, uh, porcelain that is the same weight as stone and I'm not as strong as I thought I was. That's, that's what I think we've got a little bit. When we've got these, we see them nesting one into the other. Each, I'll tell you, my plates start wobbling around five or six. 
So I'm really nervous when I see a seven and now there's an eighth plate. It scares me. I'm going, how the heck am I going to do race when I can't even project my will too far beyond the walls? I'm a, a polyp in a big reef, and it's an awful, awful big world. So the eighth daunts many of us because it's one more step towards looking at the vastness of the world and making it a just world, a loving world, a kind world. So if we're shaky or nervous about the eighth, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it means that you're going to have a natural fear of the instability of it all. Maybe we need to push through the instability, it would seem so, but just a, a statement to the leadership that people are getting, people can get very nervous, especially during times like this, about juggling the eighth. It doesn't mean it's not a worthy as heck point, uh, point to keep, but it gets scary. Second thing, for gosh sakes, follow the money. You've talked about how the money shifted over into prison, uh, 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 the prison economy where uh, inmates are making a lot of our stuff, hamburger patties and so on. And that we need to, uh, if we can keep an eye on that money and maybe figure out who's being played off against each other, this could go a long way towards fueling the eighth as a more powerful force. I think that Mr. Med uh, was it President Medina who got uh, uh, moved out because he hadn't been doing enough uh, for people of color. I'm, I'm I think his sure. last name was Medina. Uh, the problem was is that you can be working well in one area, like he happened to be there at the time. He was uh, uh, very busy at finding spots for Latinx. Is that how you say it now? Uh, for helping uh, uh, displaced Latinx from the Honduras Guatemala problems, finding a spot. He did a great job on that. He even had some of them in his own home, but he did not do a proper setup for making sure that people of color actually had a job. Tons of encouraging language, but no actual jobs. So that's something we need to work on is to actually see, is there a job, is there a stepladder for getting people in place? That'll go a long way towards solving uh, some of the pain. Uh, it's, if we can get over the fear of feeling like our structures are unstable, we just might be able to surprise ourselves and take a bigger step into a bigger, more just world than the one we're living in. You know, I know we're busting our chops to get what we got, but I think it's possible to do that. I get up every morning with some degree of hope. I might as well do it for a bigger thing. Also, the question, how do we keep one particular racial group or, uh, and women from being played off one against each other. Where, where the politician says, look, I only got enough juice to fix one group or the other. How do, you, uh, how do you get that politician to dare to love boldly and take care of two or three groups of people? I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss. Thank you, Bill. And now Bill. Uh... Oh, no, no, oh, sorry, go, our, yes. Go our religion calls us to embrace the first principles. All of the other principles are either uh, an explanation or a way of implementing the first principle. Hi, um, I'm mixed race and I have black family and many black friends. Um, and uh, I'd like to say, you know, speaking about things is very nice and um, talking about them is all well and good, but what are people actually doing to um, change the racism and change the, 
oppression that um, black people and other races face every single day in their whole lives. What are we actually doing to change anything other than talking about it? Um, so I uh, uh, suggest that every day you ask yourself what you can actually do little by little every day to help the problem other than just talk about it. Thank you. Diane, thank you. Oh, uh, Adam. Through my life, I have used too many words. And recently, I am trying to correct that. Your mother was correct about what you needed to read, but still, it had a lot of words. The way, and yes, you walk it, you don't just talk it. Important. Also, fear of change. Fear of losing power. Many issues right now make it difficult for some people to let go of the fact that we are all in it together and united we will stand and divided we will fall. Bullet points of thought, action, seems to me extremely important at this point in our lives. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. Adam. Yeah, just uh, real quick. Um, one thing is, I, I like what you said, you know, we've, we've got to be doing actively involved in dismantling white supremacy and anti-blackness. And I think that's why the eighth principle is important because it needs to keep that in our mind that that's important. Um, and we need to be affirming and promoting that that's important. Um, you, at, you talked at the very beginning about the first principle kind of, um, uh, the uh, one view is the first principle kind of covers anti-racism right and covers all sorts of stuff um and i think that's true but i also think um <laughs> i think for humans we need more than just a simple sort of summary type rule um jesus tried it when he did um when he tried to summarize everything with love your neighbor and love god above all else and um that i think was um it did not work out very well <laughs> Right, because, um, you know, because they, we're not really explaining, you know, the Bible makes very clear what our responsibility is to our neighbor to take care of the widow, to take care of the orphan, to take care of the immigrant. Um, but erasing all of that and just saying it, we just got to love each other has allowed um, some, you know, us to has allowed people to ignore a lot of that other stuff. Um, I remember being at a prayer service um and the christian preacher said we need to love people even if they don't love jesus and i thought okay this is good he said and how do we show them our love by continually reminding of the, them of their precarious position in the eternal life meaning we we tell you we love you by continuously telling you you're going to go to hell um, and that to me isn't love but if we can ignore everything else in the bible and just say we're just loving our neighbor and you know, justify that as love, then we can justify that BS. Um, and so I think we need what it means to, 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 um, to uphold that inherent worth and dignity is, um, you know, focusing on specific areas where that's a problem and definitely anti-blackness is a problem. We look around our church and we see a very, very white church. Um, there is some issue there with white supremacy that we need to um, confront. So. Me, I call on me. Um, I would like to say something. Uh, yeah, I thank you for bringing that up, Adam, because, uh, and I won't go on for too long since Bill's not here to defend himself, but I, I also completely disagree. I think um, you really do need uh, at least these seven principles to form uh, a complete, uh, well, I would, what I would call a complete eigenbasis um, for, for morality, but sort of, um, you, you, can't, you can't describe all of moral behavior. You can't fully describe what it means to be a good person using only the first principle. Uh, I think it really does take each of them. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, but that, uh, and uh, I think that comes back to what uh, Gio and, and uh, Bill, you both mentioned of, um, of, it's, we, we need to ask ourselves what it is that we're doing to do these things. But when it comes to those, 
those systemic issues. Those are not caused by one person interacting with a single other person. They're caused by the whole of everybody interacting with everyone else or, or even environmental problems addressed by the seventh principle. It's, it's horribly daunting and overwhelming to think, what can I personally do to solve global warming? Because that's not a problem that can be solved by you alone. There is no one human who can, do, who can solve that problem alone. And so if you try to think about what only you personally can do, then you're, going, then you're never going to be able to solve those problems that are emergent from that system and require all of us to work on them. And, uh, to, and in order to do that, we need to expand uh, that process. And it's, it's not easy because there's so many things uh, that we have to think about. And that, but that's why I think it's, uh, it's a constant process of uh, as, as any, a, a spiritual journey which says, well, you have to master one thing and then you're done is probably, probably selling you short on the rest of the path that you have to take. Uh, whereas the, the way that our principles are is that, yes, it, it, because it's, it's just a fact of, of, how we, of how we live our lives. We, we can only solve so many problems in one day. We can only think about so many things at once. And uh, uh, for instance, I, I heard that you, you can, uh, in your search to memory, you can remember about seven numbers is about the maximum before you, before you just can't really hold that many digits in your short-term memory without doing some kind of memory trick. It's about seven is what you can get up to unless you're some kind of, well, maybe you, maybe you, how many, how many can you do? 15, 20? Yeah, good, good, good job. Yeah, yeah. But, but for us average people, uh, yeah, if you, it, and, and you probably, get, yeah, yeah. Well, there's some, there's some great memory tricks that you can learn, but, but anyway, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> um, the point is that uh, I, I can just be thinking, just spending one, a whole week just thinking about one principle about am I living, am I truly living with compassion in my human relations for uh, just for that week? And then the next week I can think about am I, really, am, I, am I really challenging the people around me? Am I balancing the fact that I must challenge them to be better people with accepting who they are? Am I properly doing that balance? That's not something, and you can't think about that while you're also thinking about, am I living in harmony with nature and all of the creatures that live, that all the creepy crawlies that, that break into my home uh, that I have the urge to squish. Uh, you just can't think about it all at once. And you also can't think, uh, did you want to say something? As, uh, oh, oh, um, unfortunately, I, you know what? I should have signed into the Zoom meeting on my computer. I suppose I won't be able to see the comment if I, if I load it up now. Anyway. Pat, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, I, I would like people to tell me something concrete that you have done or that you could do on a practical basis to, to be in line with the eighth principle. Um, I feel about anti-racism the way I feel about global warming, that I can't do it alone. And so I, I, I'd be interested if people could tell me things they've done or would do to be actively um, in line with the eighth principle. Yeah, would you like? could, 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 yeah, so that way we can hear. On There's a lot of uh, African Americans who are homeless and are uh, food, at food risk, and um, helping them eat every day is uh, definitely something you could do. I, I, I'll also make a suggestion. Uh, Walt, I, I'll ask you to speak next. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here online, Pat. Um, and uh, one thing that uh, I think is an easy thing is that uh, there's a, well, before we can uh, one of my one thing that I think about um, for instance why why it's so hard for uh, black and white people to get together in church there's me, there's a much larger cultural uh, divide between uh, blacks and whites we don't watch the same TV shows uh, we don't uh, 
uh, look up to the same uh, look up to the same uh, pop culture figures, yeah, the same musicians. It's not this. We don't listen to the same music. Uh, we don't laugh at the same jokes. Um, uh, the co the common uh, references to something familiar uh, will be different for those groups. Um, and just and so just uh, one easy thing is to just become familiar with black culture or with Latin culture, and uh, and to just engage with those people on a on a personal level the way that you just want to get to know your neighbor and treat them as your neighbor uh, and start and you know build it from the ground up because those emergent problems are built out of all uh, it's all it, you know it's it's all because of what we all do to each other uh, it's all just um, ultimately it is built out of that. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I certainly do uh, agree with um, having things spelled out specifically, so I have no trouble. In fact, I really like the eighth principle. But as far as words that have real meaning, the things that really irritate, um, well, the Ku Klux Klan, for example, <laughs> and others, two words that really, really irritate, and you can see how powerful it is. Affirmative action. As long as we back affirmative action, uh, the court's about to destroy, I guess, uh, some of the Ivy League schools' practice of affirmative action. And its uh, Supreme Court is, I think, threatening to destroy that. But you can see by the deep, incredible anger that how powerful affirmative action is and the result of it, where you see a lot of African Americans moving into the middle class, it, it does work. So those two words, I think, do have some significance. Thank you all. Diane, I know you, I, sure. That's really wonderful, Diane. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Um, and I and so I'm going to uh, paraphrase what you just said for Pat uh, in the form of an actionable suggestion, um, because I think I think that's wonderful what uh, what you just said. Um, um, I'm sorry, I, I was distracted. Can you can you? Uh, oh yes. So. Uh, I think what would be a great idea is uh, perhaps only with your like-minded friends, uh, if they have a special opportunity, one where you normally would buy them a gift, uh, perhaps you can ask them if they, uh, if they really need, if they want something. And if they find that they don't want for anything, then that money could be much better spent uh, donating it in to some form of organization. I'm sure there are many uh, from which you can choose your favorite causes. Great idea, Diane. And I also wanted to mention to Pat, uh, I hope you're still there online, uh, that um, yeah. I, oh, hello. I, I liked your idea of doing uh, Spanish speaking lessons, uh, mainly because I've had a, a, a desire to learn Spanish uh, in recent years. Uh, and so I think that's uh, a great idea. Thank you. I just want to say that I got exposed to COVID. The reason I'm on Zoom is I got exposed to COVID and I now have a runny nose and a sore throat. So that's why I'm not with you. I hope it's the gentle COVID at worst. Bill. Thanks. <laughs> the slight variant on uh, uh, learning Spanish. There's a few places around here where uh, uh, Espanol is definitely their primary language. 
I got a really nice reaction once. I went to a place called Tio's Tacos, local good uh, Mexican food. And I became the weird Anglo who would ask uh, what, uh, uh, how, uh, you know, como se dice is a really good starting phrase. It's the, how would you say in on English, uh, in English, uh, 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 what you know? What is it? What is cabeza? What is lengua? What is uh, buque? And uh, I probably butchered the pronunciation. And by being the guy who just uh, uh, doesn't stick to the safe stuff like carne asada, but by by the simple act of sharing food, it's probably one of the more intimate the ways linkages we got with each other. And just learning a, a few uh, phrases that build around the food uh, uh, can go a long way towards just developing a sense of, well, God bless them, and they're at least trying. He didn't freak out uh, 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 when, when I served him uh, uh, lingua. Uh, so, okay, something's being done here. Uh, you know, small steps sometimes can do some really good things. Thank you, Bill. Diane, you have one more quick one. Uh, and, oh, well, could could thank you. Yes, walk in other people's shoes and online. Hi, Jenny O'Haver here. I've had to be a little in and out of the uh, sermon today, but I just wanted to share with you guys that the UU uh, Church in Pasadena, the neighborhood church, is a part of a wonderful program for folk. It's called the Esperanza program, and uh, UUers go down to Mexico, to Tijuana, and help build homes for low-income families. And I've taken my kids a couple of times, and it's a wonderful way to connect with the uh, Latino community and culture. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I think we all would like to get a break. This has been a heavy topic, so I think that'll be it for today. Thank you for all for sticking around for our discussion. Have a great day. Blessed be.